right, this is our discussion of the first part of the cardiovascular system, which discusses the blood. So looking at our blood, it is a tissue, it's a connective tissue, and the fluid part of blood is the plasma, and the cells include the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The functions of the blood, specifically within the cardiac or cardiovascular system, is the transporting of molecules, important molecules to maintain homeostasis, CO2, oxygen, nutrients, and waste products and regulating pH and maintaining body temperature. The white blood cells protect us against infection and illness and we have smaller clotting factors that help prevent bleeding when we cut ourselves so formation of clots is an essential function of the blood. When we look at what makes up the blood it's about 8% of our total body weight so if you could measure it um, the volume of blood, it would be four to five liters in women, five to six liters in men, um, which is equivalent to about one and a half gallons for men. So makes up a you know significant part of our um, total body weight, almost 10 percent was is all within our vessels. So when we look at people say with heart failure and an inability of their kidneys to filter their blood efficiently and allow them to get rid of excess fluid through urination, we use weight as, a, as something that we measure on a regular basis to make sure they're not retaining too much fluid and um, that can be dangerous and hard on a failing heart. But if we look at the components here we can see that over half of our blood is plasma, so this is the liquid portion of our blood. Of that plasma, over 90 percent is water, so that's the fluid portion of our blood, but the other 9% is made up of proteins and ions like we've talked about sodium, potassium, calcium so far. Those are important ions we would find in the plasma. Nutrients such as glucose and amino acids we would find also in the plasma portion in this smaller 2%. Waste products we talked about creatine as a waste product of muscle contraction, gases, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and regulatory substances. Examples of that would be different hormones. We've talked about parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, growth hormone, insulin. Um, a lot of those are help to regulate and maintain homeostasis. So that's what we find in this 2% of plasma. So even though it's a very small percent of the plasma, very, very important. The important proteins we see in plasma are albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen. Real brief, briefly, I'm just going to tell you that the albumins are important for holding water in our plasma, so they draw water into the blood through osmosis. And globulins are referring to our antibodies, and fibrinogen is an important uh, clotting protein. So these proteins are also very important for maintaining homeostasis. If we look at the other half of blood, the formed elements, what that means by formed elements, it means these are cells. This is the solid part of our blood. So in this case, if we take our blood and spin it down, we would have the solid portions fall to the bottom. This thin white layer is the white blood, are the white blood cells, so a very, very small percentage of the formed elements, but very important for our immune function. These are all the white blood cells we would find there. And we'll talk about these mostly in lab. So for our purposes, just know that 1% of the blood is are the white blood cells. The other remaining 44%, uh, even a little bit more than that, is the are the red blood cells. So red blood cells are the most numerous cell in our blood, making up almost half of our whole blood. And its major important role is to transport oxygen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. So looking at the plasma, like I said, it's 91 percent water. The other 9 percent is proteins and dissolved solutes. Very important. We talked a little bit about each one of these proteins, so just know a general definition of the different proteins we see in the plasma. And the red blood cells. Another name for red blood cells are erythrocytes. Cyte means cell. Erythro means red. Erith means red. So red blood cells. White blood cells. Leuco means white. You've heard of leukemia. That's when the white blood cells in the blood are growing out of control. And that's where the term leukemia comes from, which means white blood. So leukocytes are white blood cells. There's two different major groups of white blood cells. There's those that have 
cytoplasmic granules that contain different things like in the case of basophils, for example, they contain um, histamine, which is important in um, inflammation. Um, but we won't go into a lot of detail about that until we get to the immune system. So I'll just leave it at that, that these contain cytoplasmic granules, and these white blood cells do not. So lymphocytes, those include the T cells and B cells, and monocytes become macrophages, and they um, chew up bacteria out in the tissues. And again, we'll talk about this more when we get into the immune system. So I don't want to spend too much time here talking about specific functions of the white blood cells. The platelets, otherwise known as thrombocytes, their job is to fight, um, I'm sorry, to prevent bleeding. So they help in the stoppage of bleeding when someone would cut themselves and damage blood vessels. The platelets play an important uh, role in starting the clotting process. So here is a smear of a blood sample. We can see all these red circles here. These are the red blood cells, so we can definitely see they are the most numerous cell in the blood. And then here is a white blood cell. You can see how large it is. It has a visible nucleus. Here's another white blood cell with a very uniquely shaped nucleus. That's the neutrophil. And then here's a smaller white blood cell with a very large nucleus. That's the lymphocyte. And then these little fragments of cells, those are the platelets. That's where they get their name, platelet, referring to tiny plates. As if a plate were broken, it would be broken into tiny little pieces like this. So you can see they're much less numerous compared to the red blood cells. So when a person um, has an infection, for example, or some mystery illness, they will often do a um, complete blood count with a differential, trying to look at the different white blood cells that are present, how many there are, and if there's anything unusual about that sample. So in the formation of these cells, we call the process of blood cell formation hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. And recall from when we study the skeletal system that that occurs in the red bone marrow. So the red bone marrow in the epiphyses of our long bones is where red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets are produced. And there is a hormone that the kidneys secrete, which is called erythropoietin. We abbreviate it EPO. And that is that stimulates hematopoiesis when our oxygen levels fall and we need more red blood cells to deliver oxygen. Um, the kidneys will secrete this hormone, erythropoietin, or EPO, which stimulates um, blood cell production in the bone marrow. All the cells in the bone marrow that differentiate into different white and red blood cells start out as stem cells. So stem cells are early cells that have not specialized to become the different red and white blood cells. They're just a basic line of cells that are very generic and then they receive different growth factors to specialize and grow into different types of cells. So when a person has uh, leukemia, for example, and their white blood cells are growing out of control and their dysfunctional white blood cells, they will require a bone marrow transplant. That's one uh, treatment for leukemia. And what they'll do is they will, with radiation and chemo, they'll destroy the patient's um, white blood cells and then they will transplant new ones from a healthy donor. And a common place where the donor um, will have surgery to remove that bone marrow would be in the ilium of the hip here is where there's a rich source of red bone marrow to retrieve those healthy cells for the bone marrow transplant. And then the patient is um, the recipient of those bone cells or stem cells are um, kept in the hospital for about four to six weeks to recover and make sure that they're getting a good response and not rejecting those cells. So here's an example of a stem cell. We can see that it's um, just kind of a large <clears throat> generic looking cell and then it differentiates into these different types of cells. So when you look at platelets, you can see it ends up as a very large cell that then breaks up into different smaller pieces and that's the platelets. We can also see that red blood cells kind of follow their own line, but as they near maturity, the nucleus is extruded or kicked out of the cell. So there's no organelles or nuclei in a red blood cell. That makes it very efficient on carrying oxygen and it doesn't use up the oxygen that it's carrying. These other cells, these are the white blood cells, you can see they clearly have a visible nucleus. They're each unique in their own way, and again, we'll talk about that when we get to the immune system a little more specifically in terms of their function. In lab, you'll look at their different structures and how to look at them and identify the different ones in a microscope. 
So again, focusing on the red blood cell, they are um, biconcave, which means they um, sink in in the middle, almost like a sweet tart. A sweet tart is biconcave. It it's, has a shallow depression in the middle on both sides, and that's because it lost a nucleus. So the middle of that cell collapses, which makes it very good at slipping through the smallest of capillaries. It can flow through single file, even folding over if necessary, because of that very thin biconcave shape. What we find inside the red blood cell is the pigment hemoglobin. That's a red pigment, and that's what binds to oxygen to carry oxygen. And then we also find lipids, ATP, and carbonic anhydrase, which plays a role in um, carbon dioxide transport. We'll talk about that in more detail later on in this uh, car cardiovascular system folder. So functions are to transport oxygen and some carbon dioxide. So looking at hemoglobin, like I said, it's a red pigment, so that's what gives blood its red color. Blood is always red. It's never blue. It appears blue when we see the light shining through our skin to our blood, through our blood vessels to, to the blood, but um, the blood is not blue. It's red. It's either dark red if it's low in oxygen content or bright red if it's high in oxygen content. So this is a hemoglobin molecule, and the hemoglobin molecule can bind to four oxygen, so here we can see the different groups, the heme groups, each one binding an oxygen. And then there's these larger brown structures called the glob globin molecules, and that's what binds uh, carbon dioxide. So there's two parts to a hemoglobin molecule. There's the globin and there's the heme. The heme is what binds oxygen, and that's what's shown here with the help of iron. Notice that iron is in the center of the heme molecule. So in order for us to efficiently bind oxygen to hemoglobin, we have to have sufficient iron. There has to be iron in the core of this molecule. So you know people that are iron deficient can end up with anemia. They cannot transport oxygen on their hemoglobin molecules. So it's important that we have a good source of iron in our diet. But if a person has excess bleeding, for example, um, some college age women with heavy menstrual periods will find themselves slightly anemic if they don't have a diet high in iron. So sometimes iron supplementation is a good idea for those people. So we will continue our discussion in the next video starting with erythropoiesis.